This is DIA Connections. It takes 10 years to make an overnight success. 10 years. So count on 10 years before you even start to see any opportunities. Because you got to learn your stuff. You can't just walk into a dojo and say, I'm a black belt. No. It takes years to get your black belt. And you got to get a lot of bruises on the way. I had the most fun shooting on Step Brothers. We're filming the Catalina wine mixer, and there's probably, no kidding, 10 different versions of when I tell Will Ferrell he's got to change his face, or I'm going to change it for him. <laughs> I know how important the work is that you all do. I didn't know, I didn't know the size of the DIA. It's, it's massive, and it's impressive, and it's, it's really something to behold. That's actor, comedian, and former Marine, Rob Riggle. He came to the Defense Intelligence Agency to learn more about us, and we took that opportunity to learn more about him. This is DIA Connections. Hi, I'm really glad you found your way to our podcast. This episode is kind of the second half of a pair of podcasts that we like to call Two former Marines come to DIA and tell us really cool stories about their careers in Hollywood because stuff about Hollywood is always really cool. I hope you had a chance to listen to our episode with Dale Dye. Dye works as a military technical advisor on television shows and movies. He's been at it for more than 30 years, and he told us stories about working alongside Oliver Stone and Steven Spielberg. If you haven't heard it yet, give it a listen. I think you'll enjoy it. You know how a lot of times you'll watch a TV show or a movie and you keep seeing the same guy and everything? He's good and he's funny, but you just don't know his name? That guy is Rob Riggle. He's got one of those, where have I seen this guy's face before faces? I'm telling you, you know Rob Riggle. He's a scene stealer. The hangover is so funny. He's the cop that gives the stun gun to the kid that shoots Zach Galifianakis. And in 21 Jump Street, he's the high school coach that messes with Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill. Here's the deal. My track team is full of physically incapable rejects. I mean, if I wasn't the coach, I'd be laughing my ass off at how spastic they are. But I am the coach, so I need you. You need me some Doug McQuaid. We'll get into the Hollywood Rob Riggle as we go. But first, let me tell you another little side of Rob Riggle that we at the Defense Intelligence Agency find just as interesting. Riggle served as a member of the United States Marine Corps since joining in 1990 at the age of 19. He rose through the ranks and has served in various countries, including Albania, Liberia, and Afghanistan. Lieutenant Colonel Riggle retired from the Marine Corps Reserve after 23 years of total service, nine years of active duty, and 14 years in the reserves, and he earned more than 22 medals and ribbons, including the Combat Action Ribbon. When Rob found out that the Defense Intelligence Agency's mission is to provide military intelligence to our warfighters, he wanted to learn more. And we extended an invite, and he accepted. Please welcome Mr. Rob Wiggle to the stage. Not only was Rob gracious enough to speak to our workforce, he sat down for a discussion with Defense Intelligence Agency Director General Robert Ashley Jr. And for those new to all things DIA, you should know that besides being a three-star general, a recipient of the Distinguished Service Medal, and a Bronze Star Medal, General Ashley is a history buff, a music buff, and a movie buff. He has lots of buffs, and he was all too happy to sit down with Rob Riggle for a little one-on-one. Rob, thanks for uh, joining us at the Defense Intelligence Agency. This is absolutely an honor. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I know the workforce is looking forward to having an opportunity to, to talk to you, to hear from you. I joined the Marines uh, in 1990 when I was 19 years old. Um, I, I always wanted to serve. I was a very patriotic American, you know, I was raised in Kansas, you know, the traditional type Midwest guy, you know, would almost I would, during football games, I stood at attention when they played the national anthem. I wasn't even in the military. It was just kind of a thing. Um, uh, so I have a deep uh, love for this country. So I knew I wanted to serve. And um, I actually thought I wanted to be an FBI agent, uh, is what I really, really thought I did. Um, I even called the FBI when I was 19 and I said, oh, How do you become an agent? You know, and, and they were like, Well, we like lawyers and accountants. I was like, Shoot, um, <laughs> that's never going to happen. Um, they go, You can try the Marines. Uh, we, we, we hire Marines every now and then. So I was like, oh, Well, maybe that'll work. 
I think it's rather interesting when you look at uh, your career and, and how you've tracked from starting off as a young Marine, uh, 19 years uh, old, and your career making Lieutenant Colonel. And uh, if you could just talk a little bit about kind of how you saw that progressing when you first joined when you were 19. Yeah, everybody has gifts or uh, skill sets, I guess, and uh, uh, comedy and uh, that whole world just appealed to me. So I knew I wanted to try it at some point in my life. So, um, I don't know, I've, I've always said, and I've said this in the past, I just always feel really blessed to live in a country where you can have uh, more than one dream, you know. So I was able to go serve, which is something I always wanted to do, uh, but then I also was able to go pursue comedy and acting as well. So, I don't know, I consider myself very fortunate. I took a test it's called the AQTFAR. I don't even, it probably doesn't even exist anymore, but it was for aviation, and I passed it. <laughs> don't ask how. Uh, and I got, a, I got a guaranteed flight contract with the Marine Corps. So uh, I was a theater and film major at the University of Kansas, which means you're going to be a waiter upon graduation. <laughs> so Top Gun, waiter, Top Gun, waiter. I'll go Top Gun. So that's what I did. I, uh, I joined, uh, I went through officer candidate school, went through the PLC programs, um, and upon graduation, I took my commission as a second lieutenant and went off to the basic school and then went off to flight school and, and was working my way through. I went through Pensacola, Corpus Christi. I was coming back to Pensacola. Uh, I was probably going to fly helicopters, probably going to fly CH-46s. That's about what seven out of ten Marine helicopter or pilots fly in the Marines as helicopters. Um, and then I, I started looking at the math, which I probably should have done before I signed my contract. But uh, it basically said you're going to be you're going to be flying when they pin those wings on for about eight years uh, was the contract, and so it was three years before I was you know by the time I did basic school and flight school and and the rag and all that stuff. Um, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be in for 11 years before I even have the option of getting out. And then I'd be a fool to get out because I'd only have nine more years. I'm 20 years. <laughs> what? That wasn't what I, I didn't do the math. See, you should do these things. These recruiters are good. Um, <laughs> I knew I wanted to try comedy and acting. I knew I, I had to try it. I'd rather uh, try and fail than not try and never know. It's an interesting crossover because we know how much the Marine Corps values comedy. <laughs> You know, some of the funniest people I ever met were in the service, uh, and you would never know it because they, you know, they dedicated their life to service. Um, but uh, and some of the some of the uh, most unfunny people are in show business. So I, it's it's one of those things where you, you just never know. You you come across people all the time who have all kinds of skills. It's one of the things that you know, having been uh, in the fabric of wearing the cloth of the nation, you know, being a Marine being in the Army, our civilians that work for the Department of Defense, it really is an incredible talent pool, um, whether it's, you know, for all the things that people do, whether on the music, music side of the house, uh, entertainment, things like that, and, you know, one of the problems that we have, or one of our challenges, is really getting the American public an opportunity to, to see that and to meet us, and one of the great things that you do is you bridge that gap, so it's not only... They, they see the work that you do, not on the, just the comedy side, but also Rob's a Marine. And so that connective tissue that you're able to bring from your service and to the large American public, because uh, it's important that they understand that we're just like everybody else. I, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, the, the thing that always bothered me was the, the civilian military chasm. Yeah. You know, it just aggravated me for so long because the, the military is just a microchasm of society. Yeah. So we have all these wonderful talents. You know, they may, they may be infantry, they may be artillery, they may be intelligence, they may what, whatever they do, but they've got, a, they've got lives, you know, and they have personalities and they have skills outside of those things, just like everybody else. Yes. It's not like we come from different worlds. Yeah. We grew up on the same block, we just got different jobs and different, you know, views on what we want to do with our lives, so whether it's service or not, or, or public service or not. So uh, yeah, it's good to, it's, it's uh, well thank you by the way for saying that, uh, what you just said, but I think it's good for all military folks to, to get out there uh, with whatever their extra skills are and connect with the civilian folks so that they see that we're, we're, na we're your neighbors. And, and that's the best way to put it. And you know, I've said that to people time and time again, I said, we live next door to you. We just have to have a little bit of different, uh, different job. You know, one of the things I like to share with folks, and I said, well, you know, why do you do this? And I said, well, it's so that you can achieve your hopes and dreams. Absolutely.
to stay out of trouble, I went to night school. So I ended up getting my master's in public administration because that's the only thing they offered at Lejeune. Um, so if you need anybody to help you run a municipality, I'm your guy. <laughs> then I deployed to Liberia uh, in the summer of 96 uh, with the special MAGTAF. Uh, that was a very interesting experience. Um, got to do a lot of fun things. Uh, spent some time on ship and spent some time in the embassy there. Um, uh, then I uh, ended up in New York City. After a short break, we'll continue with Rob Riggle's journey from New York to Afghanistan to Hollywood. This is DIA Connections. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, transnational terrorism, do you know the threats? For more than 50 years, DIA officers have delivered defense intelligence expertise for our nation's leaders and warfighters. In the tradition of DIA's unclassified Soviet military power series, we bring you a new set of products that examines the greatest threats facing the U.S. today. Earlier this year, we released China Military Power. Now. Iran military power examines the core capabilities of Iran's military. Iran has expanded its capabilities and roles as both an unconventional and conventional threat in the Middle East. This report provides details on Iran's defense and military goals, strategy, plans, and intentions. Learn what DI's top intelligence experts have concluded about these complex threats and their potential impact on the United States and its allies. These assessments add an important viewpoint to the public conversation. Join us online. This is DIA Connections. Rob Riggle was ready to take the comedy world by storm, but as often happens, the military had a different plan. So I'm off to New York City. Got an apartment, sight unseen. It was a 350 square foot studio apartment in New York. Uh, I think my wife has a closet that size now, but it, it literally 350 square feet. Um, and that was it. I, I, I went to work uh, in the public affairs officer in Manhattan. I did uh, Marines from basically, you know, seven to seven to six every day and then would go do comedy at night uh, and just started pursuing the dream there. Um, uh, while I was there, I made the mistake of picking up the phone at 1700. Never pick up the phone at 1700. So I picked it up. I was literally walking out of my office. The phone rings, and I'm like, yeah, you know, if I'm in the, if I'm in the office, technically I got to answer. So I went back and picked it up, and uh, somebody from the Pentagon saying, uh, is this Captain Riggle? I was like, yeah. I guess. How do you feel about the phrase, leave it on a jet plane? <laughs> I don't know, sir. How do I feel about it? <laughs> you feel good because you're leaving on a jet plane, Riggle. God. So I ended up going to uh, uh, Kosovo. So I, was, I, I did some time in Kosovo. Kosovo was a fascinating time. It was very wild, wild west. There was a lot of stuff going on between the, the KLA who had gone into the hills and the Serb farmers that were left behind who were now drinking daily and shooting at anything that moved. And the KLA thought we were their allies, so they came out of the woods and down from the hills with their guns, and we were trying to take their guns, and they thought we were friends and were not. And... It was just a lot. It was a. It was a. It was a mess, uh, and and we got control of it, and it was a, It was an exciting time. So it was a really cool tour. By 2000, Riggle had left active duty and was still in Manhattan in 2001, when everything changed. What are those people going to do? Yeah. All the elevators are blocked out. Right in the sides of the World Trade Center, 110 stories high. I joined the reserves in Manhattan, and there was a one reserve unit in Manhattan. 9-11 happens, um, and my reserve unit gets activated in Manhattan. Uh, we're the only one. They, cut, they shut down the bridges and tunnels, so my unit in Manhattan, that night of September 11th, you know, I, got, I was working at uh, 42nd and Park at that time in a civilian job, um, and uh, uh, I got the call that night of September 11th from Lieutenant Colonel Brozak saying, Put on your boots and utes, report to the public affairs office tomorrow. We're going to get in a van. We're going down to one police plaza. We're going to be on the, the bucket brigades. We're going to work on the... Because we, as you have to go back to September 11th and 12th, we didn't know if there were more attacks coming. We didn't know, we didn't know anything. It was a mass confusion. It was a very scary time. 
And we thought there were thousands of people trapped under that rubble. We, we thought there could be literally thousands of people down there. We just didn't know. People were missing. So we, and the thing was, it not only did it go underground, all that cave in, but it was six stories of rubble above ground. And the buildings surrounding the Twin Towers uh, had been gouged out from the falling debris of the towers. So those were structures were unsound. So that we were afraid those were gonna cave in. And some of them did. I think World Trade Center 5 collapsed either that night or the next day. So a lot of the buildings around us. But we had to get down there, we had to try. So we, I reported down to, there's a Burger King on the corner of uh, Liberty and Church Street. That's where we, we would set our gear down there and we'd go work on the corner of the South Tower, uh, the southwest corner of the South Tower, like ants going up a hill, and we would just bucket brigade. You'd pass a bucket up, you'd pass a bucket down, you'd pass a bucket up, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, until the 18th. And then after the 18th, they declared it search and uh, recovery, no longer search and rescue, and I moved to one police plaza. Uh, at that point, uh, I volunteered to go back on active duty. I was a captain in the Marines. I had a, I had a security clearance I thought they might need, uh, CENTCOM picked me up on November 10th, the Marine Corps birthday. Um, I reported November 17th to CENTCOM, and November 30th, I was in Afghanistan. So it happened boom, 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 boom. It happened very fast. Um, and that's why you have a reserve. That's why you have a reserve. After 23 years of service, Rob retired in 2013. And as fate would have it, in 2017, he was back in the military, but this time taking an atypical dramatic role in the movie 12 Strong a true story that depicts the actions of the U.S. Special Forces team that was the first group of men on the ground in Afghanistan in the weeks following the 9-11 attacks. Why are you here? Out of uniform with that fur on your face? Didn't you get back from Kuwait like three weeks ago? Sir, apologies, technically I'm still on leave. Well, if you're here today, leave is over. Take a look around, Captain, we're a little busy. What do you want? Oh, back in my team, sir. For him, it was a dream a come true, combining two of his great loves, the military and the movies. Rob was born in Louisville, Kentucky, and was raised in Overland Park, Kansas. Like many of us, myself included, he was a fan of the movies from the 1980s. And there were some great ones. Platoon, Back to the Future, Rain Man, Risky Business. But those weren't in the category that caught Rob's attention. I was a child of the 80s, so I grew up watching Caddyshack, Stripes, Meatballs, you know, all these classic movies from the 80s, and they just made me laugh. They brought me so much joy. I thought they were hilarious. I've been on many deployments, and movies uh, do help quite a bit. And you get to know every single word. It's weird. You learn every line, and then they become part of your vernacular, and then you find yourself going through life, quoting these movies for the rest of your life. I, quote, I still quote Stripes. It's Czechoslovakia. We zip in, we zip out. It's not like we're going to Moscow. My favorite comedian was Eddie Murphy. I remember the first time I saw Eddie Murphy, Delirious, the red jumpsuit. Right here in D.C. He filmed it right here in D.C. So I saw Eddie, and I was like, well, that's the greatest thing I ever saw in my life. So I went into school, seventh grade, the next day, and I'm doing, I'm like, you know, you get, you know, the whole, you know, you can't have, no, you know, psych, you know, and I'm doing, I'm doing all his routine, you know, and I, I was like, that's, this is it. That's, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to be in comedy. I want to. Uh, make people laugh. I want to have fun, and, and I just was fascinated. It was one of those things that resonates. We all have different things. I don't know what it is. Some people, sports, art, music, it can be anything, but something resonates with you, deep in your soul. You don't know why. Don't try to know why. Just enjoy it. Comedy, acting resonated with me. It just met, it connected. It made sense to me instantly, so I knew I had to pursue it or try it, and if it didn't work out, like I said, I could live with that more than not knowing not you know if i sat around and go i should have i should have i should have i would have been really bummed out hey have you ever done a little browsing online at imdb it's the online database of information related to films and television programs check out riggle's page quite an impressive long list of tv appearances a year on saturday night live two years as a senior military affairs correspondent on stephen colbert's the daily show and guest appearances on the office and modern family and Rob is host of Riggle's Picks, a weekly segment on Fox's NFL Sunday, where Rob's comedic talents are on full display. But for Riggle, he's at his best when he goes off script. I had the most fun sh filming, shooting, had the most fun on Step Brothers, because, um, 
So Will Ferrell and Adam McKay are uh, improvisers, uh, and there's and I came up doing improv. Will and Adam came from long form improv. They were all, they were Second City uh, and Groundlings, and uh, so they, we all kind of spoke the same language. And and Adam McKay loves improv. He loves to let people go. When you make a movie, the studio gives you a big chunk of change. Let's say fifty million dollars to make your movie. You they bought the script, so you got to say the lines that are in the script because they paid for that. So what happens is you come out, you say the lines as written. Then the director gives you notes, and he'll say, "Okay, that was good. Do it. Do it with a little more anger, and you know, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. Great. Then you do it once with notes. Okay, two two passes by the book. That's what they're contractually obligated to do." <laughs> Then Adam McKay would go, all right, we got those two. Now let's have some fun. And so we'd be like, what do you want to do? And we'd be like, well, I should come in and do this, you know, or whatever. And he'd be like, do it. Damn it, I don't know what it is about your face, but I want to deliver one of these right in your suck hole. Is there anything I can do to work on that? No, so you not wouldn't... really. It's your face. And I, again, you know, you're doing great, man. This is the Kettling Wine. Yeah. We're all having a great time. Everybody's having fun. You pulled it off. All right. And so we would improvise. Half of that movie is improvised. You could probably make a whole nother Step Brothers with the stuff they cut. But if you don't change your face, I'm going to change it for you. Okay. Okay. When you look at the films that you've been in, 12 Strong, some of the comedies, the serious things, and you look at your, your role in the military, kind of how does that play in in preparing you uh, for going on the screen? You know, uh... Honestly, there's, there's not much connective tissue from my military service to, to acting. There's a lot of intangibles, though, um, uh, uh, character-wise. Um, you, you know, you got to have a thick skin. You got to have a never-quit attitude. You have to have, because Hollywood's brutal. Uh, it, it's it's, it's, it's um, very selective. It's very subjective. Um, you go in and you think you do an awesome job, and you don't get the job. And it has nothing to do with any other thing than the way you look. Yeah. You know, now they, they won't tell you that, but that's what it is. I'll share a story with you. <laughs> the time I almost quit acting. I, I'm in New York. I'm st struggling. It ain't easy. I'm being rejected all the time. I'm doing shows at night for like nine drunks. Uh, you know, <laughs> just, I'm like, God. <laughs> I gained like 50 pounds of stress eating. I was, I was out of control. I was like a snowball going down the side of a mountain. And I go in and they're like, it's Dr. Scholl's. And, and they go, they go put on, you got to put on a suit. I had like one suit. It didn't fit very well either because I was gaining weight. So I'd ride the, I had to take the six line Walk, uh, walk, or take the six line to Grand Central. Take the shuttle over. Take the one nine down, and then walk to the to the Hudson. Like this is the stupidest place I ever had in my life. So I go in, I'm, and it was raining, of course. So I'm in there in my one tight suit stuck to my body. <laughs> There's 30 executives from Dr. Scholl sitting in there, with their notepads and their stupid faces, <laughs> and they're. And this is what I had to do. I'm gelling, are you gelling? <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Rob, could you try it, uh, do it one more time, but a little quicker. You bet, you bet. I'm gelling, are you gelling? <laughs> Rob, say with a smile. You got it. I'm gelling, are you gelling? <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Walk out. Get a call. You made it. You made it. You're getting a call back. I am? Yeah. We need you to come back down tomorrow. Great. Put on the suit, the sticky, stinky suit. <laughs> Take four trains. Get there. Go in. Now it's like 10 of us. I'm gelling. Are you gelling? I'm gelling. Are you gelling? I'm gelling. You gelling. I'm gelling. You gelling. Go away. Hey, you're down. They're down to two, and you're one of them. Okay. They need you to come back tomorrow. Great. <laughs> Just come back down, go back in. I'm gelling, are you gelling? For the last time. <laughs> I'm not gelling anymore. <laughs> Didn't get the role. <laughs> Didn't get the part. Uh, I, I, I literally, I, I swear to God, I went to like some Irish pub 
and just sat there and stared at a wall for like an hour <laughs> and had to ask myself some really hard life questions. I was like, I had a career. I was doing fine. And now I can't even gel. It's hard. It's hard out there. Any actor will tell you that their own life's experiences can provide a foundation from which to draw from and use in scenes and in developing a character. As Rob explains to General Ashley, I've been able to draw from everybody I've met. So, I mean, it's not just military. Like, I, I end up playing a lot of authority figures, but I play them comedically. So I draw from my old football coaches in high school. <laughs> I draw from some of the drill instructors I knew, some of the commanding officers I had, some of my peers. Um, and you, you know, you, you draw, I observe everybody. I, I watch very carefully. And you pick up little character things, things that strike you as funny, but that's just who they are. But if I took that out and I you know, heightened it just a little bit, it becomes this great character thing that I can do. So observing your environment, observing the people you're around, that actually serves you. So there are certain things that if you, salad bar, you know, if you pick and choose the things you, you need, you can use that to your advantage in acting. I've been blessed to work with some of the most amazing people, uh, both in the Marine Corps uh, and in show business. Um, uh, I've, I've served on, on many staffs. Uh, uh, I had uh, General uh, Spider Nyland, uh, Marine Corps General, uh, a lot of wing guys, uh, General McCorkle, General Rhodes. Um, I, I got to, when, you're, when you get to work with a general, uh, what I've found, a general or an admiral, a, a flag officer, sitting in the room and watching their thought process. I was always a fly on the wall. I like to hear how they analyze things and how, the questions they chose to ask, I always found fascinating. And they could get to the heart of a matter quicker than anybody. Uh, when, when we brief the boss, we always like to give a lot of explanation. And he's like, did it happen or not? No. Why not? Well, that's what I want to tell you. He's like, da, da, da. Uh, so I always found it really fascinating. I, I, I learned a lot through observation. Just observing uh, the, the decision makers and, and the questions they ask and the things they're concerned about and where their mind goes first. Uh, I always soaked that up. I always thought that was fascinating and, and I learned a lot through that. Um, in show business, you know, I, leadership's a weird thing. Um, there, are, it's not necessarily traditional leadership. It's people that are talented, and you try to figure out what that is, what makes them tick. And sometimes there are there are clues, and sometimes there's not. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it all stem. It all comes back to one thing. It all does. Whether you're in the arts, whether you're in the military, whether you're in business, if you can't communicate with people, if you can't listen to people and understand them, uh, understand their motives, understand what drives them, understand, get you know, have leverage on what they're passionate about or what they're not, you're not going to make any progress. Uh, it doesn't matter what you try to do. Um, I I go in and try and sell TV shows. I just sold a show to T CBS. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, it's about the American Legion, <laughs> and it's going to be a lot of fun. But I, it's a sales job. I got to go in there and sell that thing because they're seeing a lot of other people come in and pitch shows. Well, I, I have to be, I have to be on my game. I got, I got to go in there and connect with those folks. I got to make them believe. I got to make them trust me. I got to make them believe that I'm the guy that's going to get it done. And here's why it's the best idea you've ever heard. And this is why you need to give me all the money. You got to be able to do that, and you got to be able to do it in the military. You got to be able to do it in business, and you got to be able to do it in the arts. So, uh, if, if you ever want growth, which I think is the key to everything, is if you're not growing, you're dying. So, if if you want growth in any capacity on a personal or professional level, learn how to communicate with people. Learn how to communicate with people. That's the key to. That's really the key to to getting traction and climbing the ladder. Uh, and then as you, as you build those skills up, all of a sudden you become a better leader. It's just, it's, it, they go hand in hand. It's hand in glove on that stuff. When Rob visited us here at DIA headquarters, he had just completed filming his new series for the Discovery Channel called Rob Riggle, Global Investigator. But you should never send a great mind to do a hero's job. What the heck is going on around here? After my 30 year stint as a Marine, comedian, and actor, I'm tackling the biggest mysteries the world has to offer. He is Rob Riggle, Global Investigator. The premise is that he circles the globe to solve the world's greatest mysteries. 
Hmm, wait a minute. Maybe that's the real reason Rob came here to DIA? I knew the DIA existed. I knew uh, the work you guys do is obviously some of the most important work in the world because you, you guys can hopefully prevent us from going to major wars. Uh, and you, uh, so I knew the importance of the work, um, but I, you know, I, I, didn't know, I didn't know too much other than that. I know you guys uh, are out there. You guys are the, you guys provide the foreknowledge for our commanders, um, which, you know, art of war so it means a lot. <laughs> it means a lot. Uh, and it helps us win, and it helps us stay safe, and it helps prevent things from getting too far down the road. So I know how important the work is that you all do. Um, I didn't know I didn't know the size uh, of the DIA. Um, it's it's massive and it's impressive and it's it's really something to behold. And I'm learning more today, obviously, getting a better grasp of it. Um, and you guys are kind of in a quandary. It's, it's like any, any, anybody who works in clandestine work or intelligence gathering, how much do you want people to know? So yeah, I understand that you, know, you do want to educate uh, uh, the civilian world about the good work that you do, um, you know, but it's, that, it's always that, that push and pull where it's like, we want you to know about us, but we don't want you to know about us. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting push-pull. Um, there's always little things you can do. I keep telling the general we need to make a movie, but whatever, it's just my thing, it's just my thing. Rob, it's been a blast talking to you. Yeah, thank you and for having me. I tell you, we could be more honored to have you uh, come spend time with us, so it's been an absolute pleasure. We've been looking forward to this, and uh, it's great. This is an honor. Excellent. Rob, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. All righty, and cut. Hope you were entertained listening to not only Riggle's exploits in Hollywood, but also his career in the military. If you want to know more about the Defense Intelligence Agency, please check us out on social media and DIA.mil. Thanks for listening to DIA Connections.